Hello and welcome to the slideshow on tea, sobriety, and the enlightenment. If you are watching this video, it's because you were not in class and are missing your tea notes. Uh, this is going to be the quick version and um, it will, you can pause it at any time though and, and reverse if you miss something. So this is the role of tea in the age of enlightenment and in the American Revolution. And also because Mr. Dowd likes tea. So we started off our talk with uh, telling you that tea is all from one plant. If it's real tea, it is from the Camellia sinensis plant. And this is a picture of some tea bushes. And uh, this is from a tea plantation, which if I remember correctly, is uh, somewhere in India. Now here's a map of where tea is, tea is grown today around the world. And if you're wondering, why do those words not look right? Well, it's, this is a French map. And anyway, tea started in Asia and then it spread throughout the Middle and Near East. And it has also uh, been taken to Africa and more recently to South America. Uh, you'll notice uh, Europe and the northern part of Asia and North America, no tea grown there. Australia neither. Now, when we talk about tea's history, we got to go back, back, back in time, uh, back to China. Uh, China is where people first started uh, drinking tea. And in the case of China, it goes back to China's first emperor of a unified China. And the legend is that he was uh, touring his newly founded empire. And he stopped one day at a camp and his uh, cooks decided to put the fires for the pots of boiling water for his noodles and his dumplings or whatever he was eating uh, by this row of bushes to help protect it from the wind. And then as the water's boiling along comes a gust of wind and some of the leaves from these bushes blow into one of the pots of water. And wouldn't you know it, that's just when the emperor comes to inspect the cooking fires and they panic because they think they're all going to be in trouble. But what actually happens is the emperor walks by the pot, takes a sniff and says, hmm, that smells good. I'll have a cup of that. And the first tea in history is served according to that legend. Now, is that true history? I doubt it. But um, at some point, the leaves fell in the water and some people thought it smelled nice and they tried it. And there you have tea. Now, the gentleman you see in this picture is Lu Yu, and he is China's patron saint of tea. And in about the year 800 BCE, he writes the first book on tea. And it's not just how to grow tea and cultivate it and harvest it. It is all about the tea ceremony, the ritual that goes with drinking tea. Liu Yu establishes tea as a social event in China. And the, the royalty and the, and the wealthy and connected people uh, see tea as a, a great occasion for socializing. Uh, his book talks about all the different utensils you need to properly serve just one pot of tea. And it gets fairly elaborate. Uh, he, uh, but this book really popularizes tea as a, not again, not just a drink, but as a social occasion. Now, there's many different types of tea that you can see. There's um, uh, black tea, there's green tea, there's something called white tea, which is the very tender tips of the plant and it's produced just like the green tea. And uh, there's a very green tea, like the Japanese sencha tea. There is uh, whole leaf teas or leaves uh, or tea served in tea bags. Here's tea with black tea with jasmine flowers inside of it for a jasmine scented and flavored tea. Um, and here again is a close-up of some uh, white tea that you can see the little fuzz on the very tender uh, youngest leaves of the plant as the tea is made. And as you get to the tea, it's grown in all uh, different uh, ways. It's produced in different ways. And as you steep it, you get different color of tea depending upon how long and what kind of tea leaves you use. Now, um, what you're missing in this slideshow is the, is the actual tea that I had under the camera. and. Uh, in class and what I talked about was the three types of tea. Now there's black tea. Black tea is tea that is um, picked, fully dried, and then you make tea with it. Green tea is tea that is picked and then those fresh leaves are steamed and then it's dried and then you make tea with it. And that steaming preserves the more of the green color and uh, you could say more of the green flavor of the tea. And then there's oolong tea which is tea that is picked and then it's dried halfway and then it's steamed and then you finish drying it and then you make the tea with it or sell it or whatever. So the three basic kinds of tea are black tea, green tea, 
and oolong tea. But again, all from the same plant. Now you look at this picture of the cups, you would probably have the cups to the right would be your black tea, and the middle would be like your oolong tea, on the left would be your green tea. And again, all from the same plant. Now, when you get to about the time of the, around the 1500 of the Common Era, you have Europeans that are venturing out in ocean-going ships that can actually travel long distances. And these ships begin to make it around the Horn of Africa, that is around the southern tip of Africa and into the Indian Ocean. And the first man to do this was a, a fellow named Vasco da Gama. He was a Portuguese sailor. But once he found the way, it was not long before ships followed and merchants began traveling to China and trading for the silks and the and the different spices, and of course, for tea. And tea became wildly popular in Europe, especially in England. And as you look at um, this picture right here, this English tea set, you can notice that uh, like uh, Liu Yu wrote about for the Chinese, tea doesn't just become a hot beverage that you put in a cup, it becomes this social event and you have fancy teapots and matching teacups and pitchers for cream and little bowls for sugar or for currants or for lemon or something to flavor your tea and look at the tray with the little pastries there. Again, tea is an, a social event, not just a hot beverage and this really is carried out particularly in England. In fact, today if you go to England um, and you are invited for tea, that doesn't mean someone's going to pour you a hot beverage, it means they're also going to feed you snacks. It's like a late lunch in England. Now, why else would, you, uh, would tea become so popular in Europe in the 15 and 1600s? Well, it's because it's something you can drink that won't kill you. Because in Europe at this time, and certainly before, the water can kill you. Um, Europe um, during the Dark Ages lost a lot of the learning from the time of the Roman Empire and in through the Middle Ages and the High Middle Ages and the Renaissance, things like basic sanitation were, were not well taken care of in Europe and when you are uh, going to the bathroom in the same area as your water supply, well that makes water that you don't want to drink. And the reason tea becomes real popular is because you can drink it because you have to boil the water to make it and boiling the water kills the germs and bacteria that live in this nasty European water at the time. In fact, even today, if you're camping and look at the beautiful mountain stream and it's bubbling over the rocks and it looks so clear and fresh and it's cold because it's melted snow, don't drink that. That has germs in it too because animals go to the bathroom by the water. So when you drink that water without filtering it or boiling it when you're camping, that can also make you sick. So yes, uh, boiling the water made tea a healthy drink. And by the way, uh, so before those ships brought tea to Europe, what did people drink? Uh, alcoholic beverages. They drank a lot of alcohol because the fermentation process that makes beer and wine kills the germs and bacteria that make us sick. So when uh, people are um, in Europe, in the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages and the times before the tea shows up, you got a lot of drunk people. And that includes young people. And it's not because people thought being drunk was a good idea, it's because that what you could drink, that didn't kill you. Now there was milk and, and things like liquid and soups that people made. It's not like there was nothing but beer to drink. I'm generalizing here, but yes, there was a lot of alcohol consumed before there was tea. And Tea drinking is tasty and stimulating. It has caffeine. It's again a social event and it's sober. So for maybe the first time in a thousand years you have clear-headed social contact among educated people. They're going not just to inns and to pubs and having booze when they get together. Now they are having tea at tea shops. You have educated people having sober conversations. And I argue that this is in part what leads to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment comes about at this time when you have tea and coffee houses springing up all around Europe and in particularly in cities, in the larger cities in Europe. Now the Enlightenment is a time of great advancements in science, math, philosophy, economics, and 
politics. Now, I bring your attention to the politics part because this is where we begin to take it to the American Revolution. Uh, so this is when Isaac Newton uh, writes his Principia Mathematica. It's when he invents the uh, calculus and has his theories on gravity. This is when astronomers are learning things like, hey, the um, Earth actually revolves around the sun and not the other way around. It is a time when they're learning about things like light and they're making observations in nature. You go a little later into the Enlightenment and Americans like Benjamin Franklin are doing experiments with electricity and they're learning from it. It is when there are theories about economics and how nations should trade with each other and, and what was the role of government and what's the role of private people and about government itself, about this idea of politics and where the power should be. Our nation is the product of this Enlightenment thinking. You have men like Thomas Paine who have read Enlightenment thinkers before him like John Locke and they're coming up with the idea that maybe kings are a bad idea, that the argument for royal rule, for kings having authority, is that they are descendant from an ancient line that was ordained by God to rule. And Thomas Paine, and as John Locke did before him, say, no, this is not true. This, is, uh, this, is, this can be uh, logically proven false. And then once you do away with that, what makes sense, and they argue what makes sense, is for the people to have the power. Um, uh, Benjamin Franklin, a similar thinker, who also did, uh, like I said, experiments with electricity. In fact, you, you know the story of him flying the kite in the thunderstorm with the key and he gets zapped and yada yada. Well, actually, that led to an invention that has probably saved millions of lives since it was. That's the lightning rod. Lightning used to do a ton of damage to structures like barns and houses, and now it hardly damages them at all because of his invention of the lightning rod which takes that electricity and harmlessly transfers it to the ground. Thomas Jefferson was also influenced by John Locke and those ideas show up in the Declaration of Independence which he wrote. George Washington, another Enlightenment there. Anyway, back to tea and taxes and the story that we all know by now, the Boston Tea Party. The Boston Tea Party was not so much about the tax on tea. It was about a tax cut given to the East India Company. America had ships at this time, and those ships were pretty fast, and they were going to China and coming back with tea. The British East India Company is a giant corporation in its time. Some people have uh, said it was the Walmart of its day, and it would bring huge shiploads of tea from India and China, where uh, England had colonies. And what happened was the executives of the East India Company went to the king and to the leaders in parliament and proposed a plan to corner the tea market. They said, hey, look, you've got that tea tax on the Americans. We want you to give us a tax cut so that we could afford to undersell the American tea merchants. Essentially, they were going to be able to sell their tea for significantly less money than the Americans could and still make a profit. This was going to effectively put American tea merchants out of business. It was this corrupt plot between government in England and the leaders of this big corporation to put American tea merchants out of business, to have a monopoly in the tea trade. That's why the Americans were so upset that they thought this was unfair and, um, and dirty dealings in business. They didn't like it, and so that's what brings about the Boston Tea Party. This is where our Americans dressed up like natives. They climbed onto the British tea ships in Boston Harbor and threw the tea overboard. Now, I would also argue this becomes one of the um, one of the great causes of the American Revolution because King George got really upset and he reacted very harshly to this American protest action, closing Boston Harbor and trying to starve the citizens of Boston into paying for all the tea. And when the other colonies saw this, they said, ooh, if he could do this to Massachusetts, he could do it to us too. The reaction of the British to the Boston Tea Party is one of the things that makes the American colonies start to come together in this idea of opposing the British. So there you have it the Boston Tea Party, why tea was important, what is tea, where does it come from, and what different kinds are there, and what does tea have to do with the Enlightenment? I argued it had to do with sobriety and clear-headed social gatherings. 
that allowed these new enlightenment ideas to take place. And among those enlightenment ideas were the ideas that are enshrined in our founding documents like the Declaration of Independence and eventually in our Constitution. Thank you. And again, go back, go back and pause. And any of the forms that you might need um, are on the class webpage. Uh, or you can just make yourself a Cornell note sheet on notebook paper. That's it. Bye-bye.